Good Sunday morning and welcome to the February 27th, 2022 edition of the Pastor's Porch. I'm Pastor Brian Schmidt, pastor of Calvary Alliance Church in beautiful Towns County, Georgia. And so glad that you're joining with us for this video today. As you can see, I'm not on the Pastor's Porch today, nor the Pastor's bus, nor the pastor's church, but again, down in the pastor's basement. Uh, today is Saturday, actually, and it's kind of a dreary, wet, it's raining even right now. And instead of being out there on the cold, dreary, wet porch, decided to be down here and uh, actually have a window with curtains on it, so it doesn't seem quite so prison, prisonous, prisonish, as maybe the other pastor's basement video was. But again, just thank you for joining with us on this video. I know that there's a lot of other things you could be watching and I get invitations to watch things all the time. And, and I know it takes time. It takes a commitment to watch a video like this. So just thank you for watching. Uh, do you remember a guy named Flip Wilson? Flip Wilson. Remember him? Uh, he was a comedian, a stand up comedian, hosted his own variety TV show. He lived from 1933 to 1998. He was on a variety of other shows, uh, including the Ed Sullivan Show. And uh, have we got a show for you? Isn't that what Ed's... Oh, anyway. But uh, he's also famous for making a little expression famous. And uh, at church, I'm actually going to play a video clip of this. But he, had, he was famous for saying, The devil made me do it. And of course, he would put it in his own way and make it absolutely hilarious. But that's what he was made. He, one of the things he was famous for was saying... The devil made me do it. And uh, a lot of people, of course, take that phrase and, and they do something wrong or something bad, something evil. And instead of owning up to their uh, malfeasance, they say, oh, no, you know, it's not me. The devil made me do it. But uh, while that's funny, maybe, uh, it is misleading. And it's not entirely, actually, it's not true at all. Uh, especially for people who have been born again, who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The person who has trusted Jesus Christ has been delivered from Satan's kingdom of sin and darkness and is now a child of God's family and a part of his kingdom of righteousness and light. Satan cannot make you, as a child of God, do anything sinful, anything against God and his plan for you and his life. Satan can't do that. If you are living in sin, if you're doing something sinful, guess what? It's your choice, all right? It's not Satan or anything else like that, even if it's something minor, all right? Maybe it's just uh, you got a little issue with lying. Oops, sorry, I bumped the thing there. Uh, maybe if it's a, just another little issue of overeating and not eating healthily. Uh, maybe if it's a little issue of gossip you know we kind of think that oh, those are just piddly little things you know we kind of think of murder rape uh grand theft you know those being oh, terrible sins but you know in god's eyes sin is sin and 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 even if it's something minor if we as believers sin it's on us it is our choice there's no but there's no excuses all right there's no excuses like i said even if it's something minor you can't say oh it's just who i am um, you can't say, oh, it's my personality. Uh, you can't say, oh, I can't help it. It's just, or, or you can't say, it's in my genes. All right, blame it on mom and dad. Now, if you are a believer in Christ, no one and no thing causes you to sin except you yourself. And Paul makes that clear <coughs> for us today in our passage, Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 23. And I'm going to read this passage for us. And uh, try not to comment too much, and then we'll go back and make some application to this for us today. So Paul says, <clears throat> What then, <clears throat> excuse me, shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? You know, Paul's like, Hey, you know, if we're not under law, and that goes back to some of the previous statements that he has made in the book, if we're not under the law but under grace, uh, if there's no law, then hey, we can do whatever we want. And wow, that's awesome. And so Paul is saying, is that okay? And he says, certainly not. Absolutely, unequivocally not. Verse 16, do you not know? And again, <clears throat> just pointing out 
Uh, the use of this word know throughout the book of Romans, it has the idea of using our heads, all right? It's not feelings, nothing more than, all right, that stupid song. But it is about what we know and exercising our brains. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness and righteousness being that condition acceptable to God. Verse 17, but God be thank Praise the Lord. I mean, this is good stuff here, Paul says, that though you were slaves of sin, and that word slaves, it has the idea of <clears throat> what we think of in terms of the word slavery, somebody that is under the control of somebody else, has no uh, authority over their own lives, they have no rights. Uh, that's what Paul is talking about here when it, the word is doulas, right? That even though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And he's talking there about salvation that they chose. Even though they were sinners, they chose to be born again. And, and they were delivered from their, their old sinful life. Verse 18, he says, And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Verse 19, Paul says, I speak in human terms. I speak humanly. All right? Uh, because sometimes it's hard for us to con grasp some of these concepts, and so Paul, he has to break it down. All right? He says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness, the frailty, the feebleness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves, and when he talks about members, he's talking about our bodies, as slaves of uncleanness. And that word uncleanness is interesting. Uh, it comes from two Greek words, ah, catharsia, all right? And if you've heard that word catharsis, it means what? A cleansing agent. Something that's clean, ah, in the Greek means no, like uh, atheist, no God, agna, 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 I'm having trouble with the word agnostic, agna. Boy, I should start this video over, but I'm not going to. Uh, but one that had no knowledge, all right? And this means no cleanness, all right? No clean, all right? Where are we at? Verse 19, slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness. Again, two Greek words here. It's interesting. Nomia is a word for law. And uh, again, anomia, no law, leading to more lawlessness. He says, just as you did that before, you presented yourselves as slaves to uncleanness and of lawless, leading to more lawlessness. So now, in this way, just like you did that before, now that you're born again, present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Now, where holiness means consecration, sanctification, purification, uh, you get the idea there. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. All right, when you were a slave of sin, you didn't have to worry about righteousness. You had no clue about righteousness, so you didn't have to worry about it. Verse 21, what fruit did you have then and the things of which you are now ashamed? You're embarrassed. For the end of those things is death, those old things that you used to do in the past. Verse 22, but now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness. And the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. What a wonderful passage here that we have before us. But I want us to notice a certain word found in verses 16 and 19. In verse 16, Paul says, Do you not know to whom you present yourselves? All right? That idea for present means to yield. And then in verse 19, he says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented, there's that same word, your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more unlawlessness. So now present, there it is again, your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. That word present has the idea of yielding. It, has, it comes from, again, two Greek words that means to stand near. It means you've chosen your side. One of our favorite movies, an old musical, is Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Do you remember that movie? Those of you who maybe watched like the old musicals, uh, it was in 1954. I had no idea it was that long ago. Uh, seven Brides for Seven Brothers. But there's a scene in there 
where the Potipi brothers, all right, all seven of those, excuse me, brothers that live up in the mountain, and of course, Adam Potipi, he's gone down to the town, and he's got himself a wife. You know who the wife, remember her name? Her, na her name was Millie, Millie, Miley, I think, uh, Miley, Millie, Millie, we'll say Millie. Millie sounds better, right? He, he married Millie, all right? And, and, and then there's Millie and Adam and the six single brothers. And, and, and Adam, he says, hey, you know, you all need to go downtown and get yourselves a wife. So the six other brothers, they go down. And uh, you might remember that scene. They go through the town and they kidnap six women, young ladies, and they bring them back up to the mountains. And then there's the avalanche and it closes the road so the townspeople can't get up there. And for during those winter months, these six young ladies are sharing the property in the house with Millie, and the brothers are out in the barn, and Adam, uh, Millie's not happy with him and let him know, so he gets ticked off, and he goes, lives up in the in the hunting lodge, and, uh, but he's up there and thinking about it, and uh, when the, the weather breaks, the snow begins to melt, Adam comes back down, and he's like, hey, brothers, hey, guys, you know what, we need to take these girls back to town, you know, they miss their families, their families are worried about them, and the brothers start to grumble and complain, like, oh, you know, we, we don't want to do that. But the youngest brother, remember his name? Remember they went alphabetical and the, the names began with, they were Bible names. Except F, they, they called him Frankincense. <laughs> anyway, but the youngest brother was Gideon. And, and I, I'll never forget this, all right? Uh, as, as Adam, the oldest brother, says, hey, we need to take these girls back. And they begin to grumble. Gideon gets up and he stands right next to Adam. And he says, I stand with Adam. All right, he he stood beside Adam. He took Adam's side. He chose his side. He didn't choose to stand with the other five brothers. He chose to stand with Adam. And, and that's what this word means when it says present, to yield, to surrender. It means to stand with, to make your choice, to make your decision. And, and in our passage today, Paul is asking us, who are we going to stand with? Who are we going to yield to? Who are we going to present ourselves to? Another way to put it is, to whom are we going to surrender ourselves? Are we going to surrender ourselves to sin and, and some things that we're going to see here? Are we going to surrender ourselves to God? Now, again, the choice is yours. Paul sa says, you know, God's not going to make you do this. This is your choice. You need to do it. So three choices. Who's your master is the first choice. Who's your master? Is it going to be God or is sin going to be your master? This, this answers the question of who will you follow? Now, sin, if you choose to follow sin, you're choosing to follow Satan. You're choosing to follow the world. You're choosing to follow the flesh. These are the three ways in which we are tempted to sin. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says, For all that is in the world. And listen to this. He says, The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. All right? These are the three ways in which we, are, we find ourselves tempted. The lust of the flesh, that involves uh, sins involving the body, the physical body. Uh, sexual sins, overeating, oversleeping, you know, uh, whatever it might be. Sins involving the body. The lust of the eyes, seeing, we look out and we see our world, tells us that it's sins involving the world. And we see the things in the world, we see the people of the world, and, and we want to be like the world. We want to have what the world has, whether it's the newest, the biggest, the best, the brightest, uh, whatever it is, we want to be like the world or we want the world to see us. And, and so that's called narcissism, which is a big thing in our world today with social media and all that kind of stuff. And then there's the pride of life, pride, pride, the original sin that we've seen in the Garden of Eden. This is sins involving doubting God because that's what Satan did to Eve did God really say all right this is questioning God and his will and, and, and I just mentioned Eve we have the example in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 it says so when the woman when Eve saw the tree the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that it was good for food all right it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desired to make one wise she took of its fruit and ate. Do you see the three temptations there? When she when, when she saw that it was good for food, all right? That, that's the, the, the lust of the flesh. And then when she said it was pleasant to the eyes, it looked good. That's, that's the lust of the eyes. 
And then a tree desire to make one wise? Wise like who, did Satan say? Wise like God. So God wasn't good enough. Satan caused Eve to doubt God and that she needed, there was something bigger and better and more important than God spiritually. And, and so that's the, the pride of life. Remember how Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? There were three different temptations. Well, there's, he was tempted more than this, I believe. I mean, he was out there 40 days, 40 nights. But we have three recorded temptations. One was that he was tempted to make stones into what? Remember? Bread, which is food, which would be the, the sins of the flesh. And then there was he was tempted to bow down to Satan. Satan, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, which was actually in Satan's right to do and, and but the kingdoms of the world there and see jesus could look out and he could see these things and, and that's the temptation from the world and then satan tempted him to test god's promises by jumping from the pinnacle of the temple tower and, and here's a satanic attack doubting god questioning god and so these are the three general ways in which we are tempted to sin the the temptations of the flesh temptations of the world and then those spiritual temptations uh, that Satan and, and and other ways we are tempted to sin. These are the three general ways in which you are tempted to sin. But you know what? When it comes down to it, though, there are really only two choices. There's only two choices. Are we going to serve God or are we going to serve sin? There's no in between. All right. There's no middle ground here. Where you, there's no percentages. You can't say, well, you know, how about 40% sin, 60% God? So yeah, I, I, I kind of thought positively of us, you know, instead of just 50 50, let's make it 40 60. Uh, no, that's not good. It's even 30, 70, 20, 80. Or you know what? Not even 1% sin, 99% God. Still not good enough. All right. With God, it's all or nothing. That sounds like another musical. Remember Oklahoma? With me, it's all or nothing. All right? But the same thing with God. All right? It's all or nothing. Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 5, 24, Luke 16, 13 said that we cannot serve God and mammon, money, the things of the world. As a believer, though, our choice must be to follow God. All right? Who are you going to follow? Who's your master? Paul's talking about that through this whole passage. Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to yield yourself? Who are you going to present yourself to? Who are you going to stand with? Are you going to stand with God? Or are you going to stand with sin? You got a choice to make. And it only makes sense that we give our lives to follow him who gave his life for us. Jesus gave his life for us. How much more should we give our lives for him? Now, our choice of master influences the second choice that we need to look at today. And that is our manner of living. All right, righteousness or uncleanness. And, and Paul again talks about that throughout this passage here. Whom are you going to yield your members to do? All right, because that's what the, the this is the, answers the question of how. All right, the first question was who. The second question is how. How are you going to live your life? How are you going to customarily do things? Now, I, I want to make that clear. It's customarily how we do things. Uh, it's kind of like our routine. It's what we're known for. Um, I drive the school bus for Towns County and, and before we drive school bus, we are to do a bus inspection, uh, before we take the bus out on a trip and we even have a little checklist there. And, and I have my little routine of when I inspect a bus, I get in, I sit in the bus and I crank the bus. And, and then the first thing I do is check the horn. I check the windshield wipers and then I look and I check the mirrors and I also check the gas gauge cause we don't want to run out of gas on our trip. And, and, and then I stand up and I walk to the back. And as I walk back, and, and by the way, those folks of you who are watching from Union Grove, that might be up there, Union Grove Baptist Church, uh, Mrs. Aldridge, she was my first bus driving instructor. And she taught me how to do all this. And, and I go back and I hit the seats on the way back, make sure the back seats. And as I do, I bump the seat bottoms with my knees, make sure they're firmly attached. And I get to the back and then I open the emergency door, make sure the do emergency door opens and closes and that the alarm sounds up at the front. And then I walk back to the front. I hit the seats just on the way, make sure the bus is clean and tidy and nothing's broken. And, and then I turn on lights, you know, the headlights and the strobe light and, you know, these lights. And I also turn on the yellow flashers 
and make sure that they're working. And then I open the door. And when you open the door with the yellow flashes on, then the red flashes come on and the gate comes out out front and there's a stop sign that comes out on the side. And then I get out of the bus while all those things are happening. And I walk around the bus. I check all the lights on the outside. I check the tires. I make sure the hub, the, the, the lug nuts are on the wheels. I check the exhaust pipe as I go around. As I go around the back, I open the emergency door from the outback. I, I, I I'm boring you with this, I'm sure. But I have this routine. And so I do it the same way every time. And that way I make sure everything on that checklist, I check it off because I've done it. Because I got my routine. It's what I'm used to doing. And in the same way, we're talking about our life. How are we living our life? All right. Are we going to live our life in a righteous way? A way that's pleasing to God as our master? Are we going to live in an unclean, wicked manner? Righteousness should be our choice. Righteousness should be our routine. Righteousness, I wrote in my notes here, but I'm, I'm going to have to change it. I put here, righteousness should be our second nature, but that's not right. Righteousness should be our first nature. Our first nature. Note verse 19 here again, all right? It says here, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness, that was before you were saved, and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves, how? Of righteousness, of right living. When it comes to making a decision, God or sin, there is no question that we should choose to follow and obey God and then live a life that brings honor and glory to him, that's pleasing to him. And Paul makes this clear in two other passages where he uses the analogy of taking off clothes and putting on clean clothes. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, he says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. All right? Put to death. All right? Th these are the things that you used to be slave to, but now you're not. Get rid of them. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. You were a slave to them at one time, but now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Excuse me, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. All right, we're made in the image of Jesus. Wherefore, there is neither Greek nor Jew, uncircumcised nor circumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. And therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on these things, tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. And he goes on. And I'm not going to take time to read the Ephesians, but Ephesians chapter 5, verses beginning verse number 3, and the verses that follow there. So, <clears throat> we're talking about here about your manner of living and we need to choose to live this way. We choose to make our master God, but then we also need to choose to live for him. And it only makes sense. When we choose to make our God our master, we are also choosing to live a life of righteousness, a life that's pleasing to him. That brings us to our third choice today. And, and my and my outline, I put it here, your motivation. Your motivation. What, what's the motivation? Motivation is why you do something. What What's the bottom line? What's in it for me, I guess we could say. Um, and, and it answers the question of why. Why do I follow? Who do we follow? Uh, it's the first question. We follow God. And, and then how do we follow? How do we live our life? We do it in righteousness. And, and, and then why? Right? And the why is, I guess, Paul uses a word, he says fruit. All right? Fruit is the result. You plant a a vegetable in the spring and praise the Lord that spring's coming and or you, you planted an apple tree or a peach tree or something like that. Then you go through all the work of uh, planting it, watering it, tilling it, weeding it, uh, pruning it perhaps. And, and all the reason, why? Because you want the fruit, the end result, all right? Paul mentions this word in verse 21 and 22. He says, what fruit did you have then in the things you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. 
all right? This is the fruit of sin. If you choose to follow sin, and if you choose to live in an unrighteous way, you know what? The fruit is, here are two things that I see. One is embarrassment, shame, all right? And, and I'm sure that we can all think back and remember some stupid, sinful things that we did before we were saved, and maybe af even after we've been born again, that we are embarrassed about today. And it's like, oh man, I wish I had not done that. I am so embarrassed. I am so sh ashamed of that right now. All right. And, and then he talks here about death as well. And, and this is talking about physical death. It's talking about spiritual death. But we're talking about here believers. And, and so it's really not talking about spiritual death because once we're saved, um, we are delivered from that spiritual death. Uh, and, and so perhaps, you know, Paul's referring to before you were saved, those things result, and he does. He says, those things which you are now ashamed. So he's looking back before they were saved. And those things result in that spiritual death. But even after we're saved, you know, if we continue to live in sin, I believe there might become a time where God says, you know what? Uh, I've been patient with you, but you continue to choose to do what's wrong. You choose to make sin your master. You choose to live in an unclean, unholy, unrighteous way. And you're bringing embarrassment to the name of Jesus. <clears throat> and so I think there's sometimes, if a believer lives that way, there might be a time where God says, you know what, I'm done with you, I'm bringing you home. Because uh, I don't want you to live this way anymore. And I don't want you to bring embarrassment to the name of Jesus anymore. All right, so there's the fruit of sin. All right, is that what you want in your life? Do you want embarrassment? Do you want perhaps an early death? And, and, and it also could just be re referring to uh, quality of life. And, and, and for a Christian living in sin, you know, that, that's that's the worst. All right? That's the fruit of sin. But the fruit of righteousness is found in verse 22. And he says, Being now have, Having now been set free from sin and becoming slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life everlasting life. And, and so the fruits of righteousness, <clears throat> again, are twofold. The first one is holiness. As we choose to make God our master, and as we choose to live in a righteous manner of living, then holiness is a result. And we should desire to be holy. We are commanded to be holy. As God is holy, it tells us in, in First Peter. And holiness is the mark of a sincere believer, one that has God as his master and righteousness as his manner of life. And so, are you holy today? You should have that desire to be holy. And if you want to be holy, you'll, you'll, you'll make God your master and you'll make righteousness your manner of living, your your modus operandi. And, and then Paul says, and the end of this is also life, talking about, yes, eternal life, life forever with God. But then I think it's also talking about <clears throat> a life that's meaningful and full of purpose here on earth. And so what's your choice today? <clears throat> what's your choice? I, uh, is it to say no to sin and yes to righteousness? I, I sure hope it is. Because you know what? <clears throat> Nobody makes you sin. The devil doesn't make you sin. The world doesn't make you sin. The flesh, in a way, yeah, if you yield to the flesh, but it's your choice to do that. All right? <clears throat> Cain, I, I don't have time to look up these verses right now. But Cain, chapter Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. You remember the story about how Adam, I mean, I, I, Adam, but Cain and Abel brought sacrifices to the Lord. Cain brought fruit. Abel brought a lamb. The Bible says that God respected Abel and his sacrifice, but he did not respect Cain sacrifice and that ticked Cain off and, and he, he just was in a bad mood and and the Lord said to Cain hey Cain what's up with you <clears throat> he says if you do right won't you be accepted he said but sin is at your door but you should have control over it in other words God's saying Cain you've got a choice you can do what's wrong or you can do what's right and we know unfortunately Cain chose to do what was wrong. Achan in the book of Joshua, chapter 7, verse 1, and then also in 20 and 21, it tells us that he faced a choice. As the Israelites went into the city of Jericho, uh, 
as God gave them victory over that city, but they weren't supposed to take anything from it. But it tells us that Achan, in his own testimony, saw the gold, the silver, and the fancy clothes, and he wanted them, and he took them, all right? And, and that's, that's the pattern of sin that we're seeing here. You see something, you want it, and then you act on it. But he had a choice to make when he saw that stuff there. He could say, you know, no, I'm going to choose to follow God. I'm going to choose to live righteousness. I'm going to choose to be holy. But no, he chose sin. And it caused a heap lot of trouble. And then David with Bathsheba, Second Samuel chapter 11, verses 1-4. through 4, It says, in the time when the kings usually go out to war, but David stayed home. All right, he's in the wrong place at the wrong time to begin with. But then he's out on his balcony. He looks out and he sees Bathsheba bathing on a rooftop. And I don't understand all that. But it says he saw her and he coveted her and he took her. Right? David had a choice and he chose wrongly. Instead of choosing God and righteousness and holiness, he chose sin and, and, and unrighteousness and then embarrassment and, and it just messed up his life from there on out. All right? So consequences, <laughs> choices have consequences. Your choice today, all right? Sin and uncleanness and embarrassment and even death or a life without purpose? Or are you going to choose God and righteousness and holiness and meaningful and even everlasting life? Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Joshua said to the children of Israel on his farewell speech, he says, And if it seems evil to serve the Lord, choose. For yourselves this day whom you will serve. Joshua says you have a choice. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua had a choice to make. The Israelites had a choice to make. You have a choice to make. First Kings chapter 18 verse 21. This is that wonderful passage where Elijah uh, has a face-off with the prophets of Baal and they build the altars and the fire comes down and consumes Elijah's sacrifice. But as Elijah has brought the people together before they actually have the contest, he says, and Elijah came to all the people and said, get this, how long will you falter between opin two opinions? How long are you going to be wishy-washy? How long are you going to vacillate between two opinions? When are you going to make up your mind? When are you going to make a decision? When are you going to make your choice? He says, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Elijah told the children of Israel, you have a choice. God or sin. And then the sad part is, but the people were silent. They didn't know what to say. Don't be silent today. Make the right choice. Choose to give yourselves as servants, as slaves of God. Choose to follow God. Choose to live a righteous life. Choose to live a life of holiness that results in, in a, a life of meaning and purpose here on earth and in the life to come. Father God, forgive us, Lord, for so often we face Various temptations. We t face the temptations of the world, temptations of the flesh. We face spiritual temptations. And so often we make the wrong choice. But I pray, Father, today that you'd help us to renew in our hearts that desire to make the right choice and that choice to follow you. Oh, God, please forgive us, Lord, for those times when we make the wrong choice. Lord, just forgive us and help us to repent of whatever it is we've done wrong to change direction and get back on the right road with you. And Lord, help us to choose to follow you with all of our heart, soul, mind, soul, and strength. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I hope you're making the right choice today. All right. As I mentioned earlier, I'm Brian Schmidt, pastor of Calvary Alliance Church in Hiawassee, Georgia. If you have any questions about what we've talked about today, you can email me, bkschmidt65 at gmail.com. And you know what? I'd love it if somebody just sent me a little email this week and gave me a prayer request or a question. Love to hear from you. And then calvaryalliancechurch.com is our, our church's website. And then we are part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, the CNMA. 
And uh, you go to cmalliance.org right there, and that will give you more information about that. At our church, we have a lot of different things going. On Sunday morning, we have our Sunday morning ABF in the Fellowship Hall that the world may know video series by Rand Vanderland. Uh, really cool. Last week, uh, they looked at the city of Laodicea, and I was looking forward to being in there, but was not able for various reasons. And uh, but looking forward to the the lesson this week as well. Sunday morning worship, ten thirty, and uh, nothing fancy, just family. Uh, the huddle is our Monday Monday morning. I can talk, yeah. The Monday morning men's group, but it meets the first and third Monday of the month. And uh, this Monday, tomorrow morning is the fourth. So no huddle tomorrow, but the following Monday, yes, uh, we will have the huddle down in the fellowship hall. Uh, Tuesday morning, we have our adult Bible fellowship, 927 in the fellowship hall, going through the book of Zechariah. And usually we have around six or seven. We've had some folks that have been having various treatments and therapies and things. Uh, but this past week we had some visitors. And so we had like nine or tens. It was awesome. And like I said, going through the book of Zechariah right now, and we're going to learn about flying roll. Flying roll what in the world. What kind of roll is it? Is it like a cinnamon roll? Uh, that's what I would like. But Wednesday evening, prayer meeting, 6 o'clock. And uh, just praise God for the folks that come to prayer meeting and for the prayer time that we have. It's wonderful. I invite you to join with us. If you're within sight of Brass Town Bald, you can see that tower up on top. <clears throat> if you're in Towns County or Clay County or over in the Union, down in Dwight, over in the uh, Clayton, Raymond, Raymond County, <clears throat> yeah, I invite you to come. One of these, all of these, uh, be glad to have you come visit with us. And again, if you have any questions, email me, bkschmidt65 at gmail.com. Again, thank you for joining me with this video. We hope to see you in person sometime or again next week via the Pastor's Porch. God bless. Have a good week.